All right. So we're missing Josh this week. Um, we're talking about urolithiasis. Now, in the textbook, um, for anyone new that's joined in, um, actually, I will just say, because we've got some membership candidates, I think, joining us this year, um, or membership candidates for this year joining us. Um, so anyone new that's joining, um, we started this tutorial series essentially for um, sort of membership level um, education, I guess, because there's not that much out there, particularly for free and casual um, at that level. And Josh, who has been my resident for the last two years, uh, sat his memberships last year and now is studying fellowship. So I often pick on Josh. I won't pick on anybody else unless yeah. they <laughs> volunteer themselves. So in sessions where Josh isn't here, I'll often say anybody, but please do make it as interactive as possible. I hate just talking nonstop. It's not as good for anybody's education. And I rarely laugh at people's responses as the regulars can vouch for. Um, I'm usually quite nice. Am I? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, good. Um, so this, in the textbooks, um, urolithiasis is dealt with in separate sections. So ureterolithiasis and um, lower urine. Well, I guess the ureters are technically lower urinary tract. But I thought just because the medical management things it, they all they blend together so much so we will kind of be kind of jumping between we'll kind of be kind of jumping between chat um uh, so uh i just want to start with what the anatomy looks like of the lower urinary tract so we've got renal pelvis as the end of the upper urinary tract and then what happens after that ureters exactly yeah how big are they? Sorry, I didn't understand that. How big are they? I said. In in they're really really tiny. I'm not asked after measurements. I can give you measurements if you want. I think I wrote them down somewhere. Um, so dog ureters, uh, and these are based on research dogs who are hounds of unknown description. Um, 2.7 millimetres is the maximal stretch of a canine ureter. Tiny, tiny. When you think about the size of sort of stones that we can see on radiographs, tiny, tiny. Um, and cats, 0.3 to 0.4 maximal stretch of the ureters, millimetres, that is. It's really, 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 really tiny. Um, so if you're seeing a, a urolith in a ureter, or ureterolith as they're proper name is um if you're seeing it on a radiograph it's way too big to be in that ureter it's got to be causing some sort of obstruction um and then what happens at the bottom of the ureter how does it interact with the bladder in health it enters at the trigon good is it just the tunnel. yeah tunnel tunnel. through the wall a little bit doesn't it yeah it does exactly um, does anybody, can anybody describe the ureterovesicular junction? Or vesico-ureteral junction, as it's actually called, sorry. It, it might have a bit of a valve on it, does it? does, yes, yeah. Now, I didn't practice this, but let me see if I can um, draw something for you. So we've got a ureter coming down like this, and then we've got a bladder out like this, an urethra. The ureter enters in through the serosa really cordially, and then it actually tunnels between the serosa and the mucosa cranially to empty into the dorsal aspect of the bladder through the ureteral papilla. So I want you to imagine now what happens when oh my blood is on the move <laughs> oh. is that you oh, that, that's that's me sorry uh, <laughs> I, it's not i'm using the phone and it's not fitting in and i was just moving it so i could see it <laughs> oh right <laughs> well it's good actually because i was going to erase my bladder and 
draw a new bladder, which is really, 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 really full, which means that the angle of the ureter all of a sudden it gets really kinky. Can everyone see how that would happen? How when the bladder fills up, the ureter kind of kinks and it slows down bladder filling by putting a little bit of back pressure up into the kidneys. So we decrease GFR when the bladder's over full. Mm. Now the purpose of this valve is as the bladder gets full, it, it's not actually a valve, it's just this kind of kink, kink that happens. When the bladder gets full, we get increased hydrostatic pressure in the bladder, don't we? And if you happen to have a urinary tract infection or even just some um, like kind of bacteria passing through the bladder, which is not uncommon, if the bladder's under pressure, that bacteria could get flushed back up into the kidneys more easily. Where if the bladder is not under pressure, there's kind of one way flow through the ureter. So it's just a mechanism to decrease um, uh, ureterovesicular reflux. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. much. Um, now the importance of that uh, for us clinically is understanding what happens in our hospitalised patients when their bladders are obstructed, um, risks of pyelonephritis if the, they have a UTI associated with that obstruction in particular. Um, and also dealing with urolithiasis, obstructive ureterolithiasis specifically, if you're, one of the ways that we deal with them is via stents. So if from a medicine specialist perspective, we're doing a cystoscopy and we're flushing fluid into the bladder and we're filling up the bladder and we're trying to get into the ureter and it's like all of a sudden back here and it's really kinky. Whereas if you take the pressure out of the bladder, you're going to be able to access the ureter much more easily. Mm. So from a sort of procedural perspective, it's a really nice thing to have a nice picture of. Um, Okay, what happens after the ureter goes into the bladder? We've always got the bladder, and then what's the rest of the urinary tract? The urethra, and then the either the penis or the vulva. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of the extent of it. So talking about urolithiasis, where are our stones going to get stuck? Most times, ureters. Uh, urethra, sorry, but of yeah. course in cats you have ureters as well. And, and dogs actually. And dogs too, yeah. yeah, and dogs, yeah. Certain breeds, we'll get into it a little bit more, but um, certain breeds are quite prone to ureteral urethiasis. Okay, why don't we start with nephroliths? We didn't really, we didn't really talk about them in our upper urinary tract section. Um, what sort of stones are they most commonly? True. Calcium. Yeah, exactly right. Um, cats, they're all calcium. Dogs, every now and again, associated with pyelonephritis, we'll see what what stone do we see in the presence of infection? Struvite. Right, excellent. So every now and again, dogs will make a stone in their renal pelvis that can then lodge in their ureter uh, if they've got an active pyelonephritis. Active pyelonephritis. Um, we're just getting a little bit of feedback. Um, we're just getting a little bit of feedback. I'm going to um, mute you, but please feel free to unmute yourself if you want to um, contribute. Um, so what else other than stones might cause a ureteral obstruction? Well, no, 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 no. Good. Yeah, good one. I'm going to tick things off my list as we go. What else? Blood clot. Good. Why would we get a blood clot in the renal pelvis? But I guess the simple answer is if your kidney's bleeding. Yeah. Um, like a coagulopathy. Good. Trauma. Yes, excellent. Neoplasia. Yes, excellent. Dan, e. 
idiopathic renal uh, in uh, german shepherds oh german <laughs> did you say idiopathic yes yeah yeah so, yeah. so idiopathic renal hematuria we don't know why they're just bleeding um but yes blood clot for sure so blood clots in the renal pelvis so if you think of like they're all jelly like when a blood clot first forms but then it kind of gets crunchy and they can actually become mineralized because they cause a bit of inflammation you end up getting other solutes kind of coming out of saturation uh, um coming out of their uh what's the word turning into crystals coming out of solution that's the word um and turning into crystals and then mineralizing those blood clots so they can essentially act exactly like a blood uh, like a stone uh, very good what else can plug up a ureter or i should say obstruct a ureter not plug it up if that's a hint a spasm yes spasm or narrowing of another mechanism what if we'd had a spasm? Like an external pressure pushing yeah. on it Good. yeah excellent Picture. what if you had a stone that got stuck oh. and then you passed it yeah like a scar tissue Good. What's that called? stricture yes exactly right um now if josh was here i'd really push him on this but um sam mentioned extramural pressure on the ureter causing obstruction has anybody heard of circumcaval ureters yes yeah so, so some cats and in one study it was up to 30 percent of normal cats have ureter that goes right here, I think it is, it goes up and around, it is, did someone um, goes up and around the paver, which causes some um, um, uh, extramural obstruction. And if you then get a tiny, tiny, tiny stone or a little bit of debris or something like that in there, then it will lodge in there where a normal ureter it wouldn't lodge because there's just that extra pressure on the outside. Um, so strictures and sometimes there's congenital stenosis as well as stricture or extramural pressure. But obviously those dogs, typically dogs, but also is reported in one cat, um, uh, are um, affected very early in life. So before they've developed stones and stuff like that. Okay. Let's talk about why stones form. Back to sort of pure stones. What's the what's the trigger? What's the, what's the trigger? It's to do with the supersaturation of the urine. Good, excellent. Yeah. Um, so what does that mean if you're explaining it to average Joe on the street? What's super saturation? Well, well the urine's too concentrated, but yeah. it's more than more than dehydration, surely. Yeah, exactly. So every every solute so if you're like dissolving salt in water you can add salt you can add salt you can add salt you can add salt and then it just gets too salty and the salt won't dissolve anymore so every solute has a maximum um capacity that it can that water can hold in a dissolved form i'm so bad at chemistry i'm sorry for my terminology if anybody's better at it than me um but you know same as sugar you, could, you just you can't put 10 sugars in your tea because it'll stop dissolving. Um, same thing with urine. So if you've got really, really, really salty or sugary or, um, uh, you know, excess calcium, excess oxalate in your solution, you're going to end up um, with crystals forming. So a crystal's always going to lead to a stone. No. 
No. Crystals happen often. Crystals happen often. Um, Ganilla, I'm just going to keep um, you on mute. Ganilla, I'm just going to keep you on mute. Um, but thank you. Um, just because I'm getting some feedback um, when you're unmuted. But as I said, please feel free to, if you if you want to um, jump in, unmute yourself and jump in, but then mute yourself again if you wouldn't mind. Um, so if we've got super saturation of one element over another, we're going to get crystals of that element. So for example, if we've got a lot of calcium being excreted, what situations what might we get excess calcium being excreted? Hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia, exactly. That's the most common one. Um, any breeds that you can think of that have weird calcium metabolism excretion? Do schnauzers have a predisposition? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We don't we haven't really characterized that very well, but they've definitely got an increased fractional excretion of calcium in their urine. So they excrete more. Sorry, which breed was that? Schnauzers. Our schnauzers. Right. Schnauzers and shih tzus. Shh. Dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's other breeds as well, but they're the ones I remember because they're shh dogs. Um, okay, so we've got increased urine concentration or increased solutes in the urine um, or excess um, secretion of, of certain things. What other factors in the urine might mean that that crystal is going to then be predisposed to turning into a stone? pH. pH, excellent. Can you tell me more about that? <laughs> I'll try. Uh, um, the acidified urine, um, I think, is more likely to put out calcium. Mm. Um, okay. And uh, alkaline urine, more likely to put out struvite. Good. Um, excellent. Um, any so calcium and struvite, calcium oxalate and struvite are the two most common stones we see by far. So, if you look at stone analysis, you know, the hills and Purina have been running stone analysis for so long now. Um, if you look at them, they're pretty much like 37% of calcium oxalate and 35% of struvite. What are the other 30%? I don't know the 30%, but there's cysteine. There are certain predispositions to cysteine. Good. There's um, biurate. Good. There's xanthine as well, but we don't need to know about that. <laughs> At a membership level, for sure. Um, so let's then kind of jump to... Mm, am I ready to jump? Talked about pH. What about what other factors might contribute to crystal formation after urine collection? Temperature. Ooh, good, very good. Exactly right. So presumably body temperature is stable enough that we're not going to get crystal formation. Um, what were you going to say, Pooja? I was going to say urease bacteria. They are but I don't know if they they form crystals or uh, just stones because they are needed for the struvite stones. They are, exactly. What are the urease producing bacteria? Staphylococcus. Good, excellent. There's a corny bacteria something which I can't remember. There's a corny bacteria something which I can't remember. Ganilla, you were speaking. Let's give Ganilla the floor. Staph? Yes. Yep. That's the only one I'm no, sorry. All oh, right, sorry, I thought you said another oh, one. Right. Sorry, I thought you said another one. No, no. <laughs> okay, anybody, anybody else? Isn't there corny bacterium? Good, yeah. There's more. One in particular that's commonly associated with complicated UTIs, one organism, um, is more likely to be associated with pyelonephritis. That E. coli? That's not actually. That's the most common cause of UTIs for sure, and therefore causes pyelonephritis commonly. But 
for if you compare like E. coli UTI with this organism, do you want me to just tell you? Yeah, Proteus. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> good. Yeah. So Proteus have like specific um, virulence factors which allow it to get up into the kidneys better than the other organisms. So Proteus UTI, I'll always treat as a complicated UTI and we'll talk, we're going to talk about cystitis next week, I think, or next fortnight. Um, so we'll talk about that more. Um, but Proteus is a urease producing bacteria as well. And then the last one's Klebsiella. And Helicobacter, but we don't need to talk about that in this context. Mm. So say you've got an infection with one of those organisms, what's your UA going to look like? What was your question? I missed it, sorry. Uh, what's your urinalysis going to look like if you have an infection with one of those organisms? Probably cloudy urine, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and you'll have pyuria. Pyuria, excellent, yeah. And there's one factor which we've, we've talked about associated with the struvite urolithiasis or struvite crystal formation. Alkaline urine. pH. Alkaline urine, exactly. So it's, it's one of the only situations where we see really high urine pHs is infection with a urease producing organism. So it's a really big hint if you're looking at, you know, you know, you know it has got a stone and you're seeing pyuria, which is not uh, not surprising when there's a stone because it's going to cause inflammation, obviously, but you're, you're seeing really alkaline urine, it's probably got an infection with one of those organisms and it can really help you with your antibiotic selection because it, you, your selection with those organisms is going to be quite different from your most common one infection, which is E. coli. So you're not going to choose an E. coli specific drug if you've got an alkaline pH. Yeah, that, that's interesting, Anna, because I've had, I've always used a marker of 8 pH as a urinary tract infection suspect, but I have had a few cases where it, I've got a negative culture. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. And that might be, so one of the organisms I didn't actually mention is mycoplasma that can cause as urea is producing. Okay. So negative urine culture. Corona bacteria and mycoplasma don't like to grow in culture. So there are two potential reasons why that you might actually have a UTI, but the culture is negative. Um, and then there's other reasons why, like um, the urine's really um, sat around for a while, that used up all the nutrients, the bacteria died, the dog had one dose of antibiotics beforehand, you used chlorhex before you did your cysto and you got chlorhex in the sample, killed all the bacteria, there's lots of reasons why urine culture might be negative, even though there's an active infection. But then um, there's also a lot of times where the urine pH is has altered because of temperature changes. So the pH by the time it got to the lab was eight, but when it came out of the dog, it was seven. So um, there's, yeah, there may not be an infection when there's a high pH, but there's so many other variables that we need to consider. Um, so I think you're right, Jeff, keep it on your radar as a, as a risk of infection if you see a high pH. What is it about urease producing organisms which results in an alkaline urine pH? The, the key is in the name, but you need to know. Ooh, what do you need to know? What does a urease do? It's an enzyme. Mm -hmm. Good. What? How do you know it's, it's an enzyme? Something because it ends in ace, yes. and it has something to do with urea. Yes. So I'm making all this up. So maybe the urea breakdown? Yes. Yay. 
Excellent. Yeah. What's urea made of? What's what are our products going to be if we've got ureas? Ammonia. Ammonia. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Um, and what happens when we've got super saturation of a solute in solution? What's going to happen to it? Comes out of solution. Yes, exactly. So we've got urease breaking down urea. We know urea is the, present in urine in very high quantities. So we're going to have ammonium coming out and um, coming out of solution, forming crystals with what? What is struvite made of? What is the ammonium bond binding with? There's magnesium and there's phosphate. Good. Magnesium, ammonium, phosphate. Perfect. Um, very good. So if we've got excess magnesium, excess phosphate or excess ammonium, it's good. we're going to be prone to developing struvite, but the ammonium is the key to it. Otherwise, magnesium phosphate won't do much. Um, okay, what? Let, how do we diagnose? What testing do we want to do on our patients that are presented with strangurea, for example? You're suspicious of stones. First thing is to do a urine analysis. Yeah, great. And then maybe look at the bladder and see if you can see um, shadowing. Yeah, what are you going to look at with? Ultrasound. Good, excellent. Yeah. But you can also take x rays of the abdomen, caudal, sort of focusing on the bladder. Good. Um, I think that's a really important point. What are the pros of ultrasound in diagnosing um, urolithiasis? Radio loosened stones won't show on the x-rays. Good. Excellent. What are the cons of ultrasound? You can miss because it's operator dependent. Easily, yeah. It's actually really hard to quantify stones on ultrasound because they sit in a big pile at the bottom of the bladder and they shadow. So you, you see the ones at the top of the pile, but you don't see how many are at the bottom of the pile. And likewise, often we've got a lot of crystals, which also echo. So they send ultrasound waves back. And you can have like a five millimeter stone sitting in a layer of crystals and actually miss it because there's just a big shadow from the crystals. So you've got a really, if you see echo dense um, material in a gravity dependent location in a bladder, You've really got to move the bladder around, watch it while you roll the animal around and see whether there's something chunky in there, which might pose a risk of obstruction because that's definitely going to change your management strategy. Um, okay, so what are the pros of radiographs in diagnosing stones? Gives you a global view so you can, like, see the if you position properly you can actually even see the urethra ure good actually i should have mentioned that as one of the cons of ultrasound it's a big section of the urethra that you're missing um what um what are how would you take your radiographs to optimize your ability to like if you're really suspicious of stones what would you do you mentioned positioning so that you can see the urethra which is perfect is there anything else you can do to maximize the diagnostic capability of the x-rays? Use a good nurse who knows what she's doing. <laughs> do contrast. Contrast, excellent. Uh, what sort of contrast would you use? Uh, I've had better results with double contrast. Yes, tell us, how do you do that? Um, I think, uh, yeah, air, well, actually, Preferably not air, but you can take oxygen from your machine mm -hmm. or, in theory, carbon dioxide if it's available. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then um, a, a um, soluble, like an intravenous uh, capable, uh, iodinated um, the contrast. Right. And yep. then you, you, shake, you, you roll the dog around a bit and shake it all. See what you've got. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's exactly what I do is air and I often take a radiograph 
while I'm actually injecting air. So I'm inflating the urethra, which sometimes a positive contrast because you're looking for echo, uh, not echo dense, radio dense objects, positive contrast kind of hides them. They're like camouflaged in there. Whereas if you use negative contrast and the air is black and surrounding something that's maybe mildly mineralized, you can see it a lot better. Um, I don't have them. Um, I did, had a case uh, recently with radiolucent stones, which we did negative contrast and they made beautiful x-rays. Uh, anyway, so fill it up with air and then just put a little bit of positive contrast in there. Roll your patient around and that contrast coats the stones and just makes them more radio dense. And particularly if you've still got the air in there, they're going to show up really nicely in contrast with the air. Um which stones will show up on radiographs? Calcium, mm -hmm. um, struvite, um, that's pretty much it. Anything mineralized will, and often stones that won't show up on radiographs end up with calcium coating them or struvite coating them because they get a secondary UTI. So sometimes even radiolucent stones can show up on radiographs. What stones don't show up on radiographs? Oxalate. Oh, oxalate, calcium oxalate should. Oh, should. calcium oxalate, sorry, yeah, yeah. I'm mistaken. Yeah. Mm. There's Steen Ronshaw, is it uh, Bayeret Ronshaw? Yeah. And Bayeret, did you say? Yeah, perfect. Does anyone have a good way of remembering that? I use I can't see you, cysteine you rate. See you. I can't see you. Um, excellent. Okay, let's talk about. Oh, sorry, what other tests? We're going to have done ultrasound radiographs, urinalysis. What other testing should we do in these patients? Urine culture. Yes, good. But also, I uh, think, wise to uh, get biochemistry and hematology as well. Ooh, what are we looking for? Uh, well, the culture, obviously, the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, the biochem, you want to see whether there's the clinical renal compromise or not. Yeah. Um, and uh, whether there's liver disease. Good. Accompanying. What's um, the liver disease? Um, significance. Uh, I'm afraid my aging brain won't cope with it. There's, you can. You might have a shunt. Yes. Good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh. All liver dysfunction. So we might not be at the point of a shunt yet. But if you've got inappropriate, um, oh my gosh, urea cycle function, you can end up with urate urolithiasis. What breed is a classic for not having a shunt but having urate urolithiasis? Dalmatian. Good, exactly right. Yeah. Um, so I can't remember what the mechanism of that is, but I've got it drawn somewhere. Oh, well. Um, definitely looking for liver function, but also knowing the the breeds that are prone to that. So um, Dalmatians are the classic for ure urolithiasis. Um, okay, let's move on to management. And this is where we're going to talk about ureter, ureteral lids separate from lower urinary tracts from bladder and urethral urolids. So say we've got a patient who's presented with no azotemia, off food, vomiting, and has one normal size kidney and one enormous kidney on palpation. On diagnostics is found to have a ureteral lift in the proximal ureter, which measures bigger than the ureteral diameter. It's a cat. Did I say that? Sorry, it's a cat. Um. And a dilated proximal ureter and a renal pelvis, which is 
um, hydronephrotic. What are we going to do for this cat? What are our options? I'm send it to surgery. <laughs> what surgery? Uh, the, Is that just because you don't want to deal with it anymore? <laughs> yeah, they put in a yeah, urethral bypass these days. Cats, yeah, they do most commonly. Yeah. Um, is that the first thing we're going to do with them? It's got it's non azotemic fluids. I would start the cabin fluids. I think rehydration is important for sure. Um, so if we were in an exam situation, I'd want you to cover those basics as well. Um, pain management analgesia. Yeah, this will be painful. Yeah. Yes, it would be really, really sore. If you ask any humans that have passed a kidney stone, uh, really sore. And that's why the cat's not eating and vomiting um, because it's obviously not azotemia causing that. Um, what are our options other than surgery? How successful is medical management? Struvite, it's pretty good. Struvite's good. How often do we see struvite in the, in the ureter? Sorry, what was that again? How often do we see struvite in the ureter? Uh, not commonly. Not commonly. And typically we have to unobstruct them to be able to um, uh, what, what am I thinking of? To get the medical manage like get them stable enough for medical management, dissolution management to work. If that makes sense. Um, so most of the time it's calcium oxalate. It's not going to dissolve either way in time to unobstruct the ureter and save the kidney. There's one other thing we can do other than fluids pain management. And there are, there's a, a few other things medically that we might be able to do. Anybody else think of anything that might help? What about muscle relaxants? Smooth muscle relaxant. So that you mean midazolam, diazepam? Yeah. Some people use them. Some people use gabapentin. Um, in theory, the tone in the ureter is maintained um, by alpha adrenal receptors and, um, oh, my goodness. The loc there's a peristalsis in the ureter is not neurally mediated. It's stretch of the smooth muscle results in a wave of contraction in the ureter. So it's not actually um, responsive to sort of um, like the same things that you'd use to relax the bladder kind of thing or the urethra. Um, so sometimes alpha adrenal receptor blockers are used. So Prazosin blockers, is that right? Acetylpromazine is another one, I think. Is it? I think it's a, an alpha blocker. Not adrenal receptor. Is it? ACP? I thought it was, but yeah. it was to check that. Yeah. <laughs> Good sedative. <laughs> They'll be right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but more thinking of the things that you use to dilate a urethra in a cat with spasm. You can also use those agents to relax the ureter in theory, but the studies have shown that the only things that really make a difference are fluids and pain relief. There's one more thing that we can do to decrease spasm, and that's actually decompress the renal pelvis. So if you've got pressure builders, you've got a stone in the ure ureter and then the pressure's building up, building up, building up, the spasm actually gets tighter and tighter because the pressure on that stone is more. So by decompressing it, sometimes the ureter just relaxes and the stone can actually pass, but it's not going to happen. You know, if you've got a five millimeter stone in a cat, it's not going anywhere. You need to put a bypass in. Um. So the two options for bypasses, and Jeff mentioned surgery. What's the other option? So surgery to replace a 
subcutaneous ureteral bypass system is what I would imagine. I think, Jeff, is that what you were referring to? What's the other option? Stent, ureteral stent. Good. Um, so this is a feline patient. Um, what if it was a canine patient? Which would our preference be? I think canine, it's a ureteral stent. And for feline, it's sub, sub, uh, sub, the subplacement. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because it is very much clinician preference. And most of the clinicians in Australia are um, sub in cats. But there's a, I mean, Davis in um, California use stents in cats commonly. Um, the thing with cats is that they're so small, you would have such specialised equipment to place it minimally invasively, whereas in dogs you can actually put a stent in with really low impact on the dog. They're out the same day. Potentially, you know, if they're non-azotemic, you can go in cystoscopically up the ureter um, with a wire and then push your stent in over the wire and then job done. And then if the stent starts annoying them, gets encrusted, gets blocked, gets infected, you just go in and either pull it or replace it without any surgical, no incisions or anything. So stents are a really nice option if you can get the wire past the obstruction and most of the time you can. Um, with neoplastic obstructions, stents provide a really nice several months reprieve from that ureteral obstruction. Um, so if you've got a TCC at the trigone, we can actually place a wire through the kidney under ultrasound guidance down the ureter, pass the neoplasia into the bladder and then grab it with the cystoscope. So we've got a wire going out the side of the dog and then out the urethra. And then we just push a stent down over or up the urethra into the kidney. Um, so we bypass that neoplasia. So stents are really nice, minimally invasive, minimal impact on the patient um, way of relieving a obstruction. They're expensive as, a, as are subs, but um, they're so interchangeable that I think there's definitely an argument for stents in cats if you've got the equipment to place them minimally invasively. Um, equipment and training, I should say, which I don't. So I always send them to surgery. Same as Jeff. Um, is that something medics do, like placing the stent? You said ultrasound uh, library, or is it radiology? No, uh, we work with radiologists to do it. Like so it's not uncommon to have a surgeon, a radiologist, and a medic in the theatre because it's fun and everybody likes to do minimally invasive stuff. Um, but, yeah, certainly, I mean, the AMC, which, who kind of pioneered the subs and stents, their medics and surgeons all do sub-surgery because it's quite simple surgery um, and they're kind of trained in it and do it and it's quicker than waiting for a surgeon to become available and, and yeah, they just all kind of work together on the interventional radiology stuff. It's a bit of a grey zone. Yeah. Is it done here anyway? Like, is anybody doing it here? Stenting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, the main thing is having the right equipment because they, uh, emergencies, obviously. Um, but yes, certainly um, most special centres would have a stent in stock that would be appropriate for most dog sizes, but not cats. I think Vsos is the only place doing feline urethroscopy. I'm not sure. I shouldn't say that because I might be wrong. Um, Okay, so we've talked about ureteral management. What about urethral obstruction? What are our options to manage urethral obstruction? Pass a urinary catheter, like on law. Yep. Hydropulsion. Hydro yes, perfect. Yeah, that's probably the best option. Get the stone back up into the bladder. Um, what si What other management? So say we saw bladder stones and we thought, ooh, they're small enough, they could cause a blockage but not big enough to warrant putting this patient through surgery, what are our options to retrieve those stones? Uh, you could, there's a width of trypsy. Yeah, you could, there's a width of trypsy. Yep, exactly. Yep, exactly. Oops, sorry, Ginella. Um, uh, Lithotripsy works 
there's two different ways that you can do it. You can do um, a, like from outside the body and the stones have to be quite big. So they do that with nephroliths and ureteroliths um, to break down those ones. Um, and you can do it with laser. So you can break down the stones in the bladder to a size that's small enough for the dog to pass, or you can break them down in the bladder with your laser and then grab them with your scope and take them out with you as you go. Um, so both good options. What other options are there for quite small stones? Uh, you could do hydropropulsion. Great. Yes. Voiding urohydropulsion. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Like fill it up, squeeze it and try to sh just shoot them out with manual pressure. Yes. Have you done that with me? No, but I have done it in my life. Um, it's really, and it fun. Works. It's really fun. Um, <laughs> so if anybody it's has funny. not done this, <laughs> um, so stones, uh, they say less than five millimeters in female dogs and less than, um, one millimeter in cats. Um, but essentially what you do, if you see, you do an ultrasound, you see stones in the bladder, they've got some, um, hematuria and obviously the stones are impacting their bladder. And you want to get a stone analysis to work out whether what you need to do to try and decrease progression of this, but it's not bad enough for the patient to go to surgery. You can relax the patient. Obviously, they need to be really relaxed. Um, if the bladder is really full, you can just do it with a full bladder. But if you need, you need a full bladder, so you place a catheter, fill it up, and then stand the patient up. So dogs have to be small enough to be able to be lifted so that all of the stones fall into the neck of the bladder. And then you squeeze really hard into a kidney dish and catch what comes out. And you've essentially got stones at the bottom and this huge amount of urine or saline that you've put in the bladder um, pressure behind it. And they just come out in a big rush and tink, tink, tink into the kidney dish, uh, which is quite fun. And often like you really can clear out a bladder if you get them in the right position, a little bit dorsal, vertical, but a little bit dorsal is the best spot. Is that apply to both males and females? Uh, no, it's not. It doesn't work very well with males because of their os penis in dogs. Mm. Um, you can get them into the ureta, into the urethra, but sometimes they get stuck. Um, then you just push them, push them back in, and they no, I'm done. But <laughs> um, and male cats are just so small; they're little penises that um, I only do it with very, very, very small sandy sediment in male cats. Um, okay, what about, uh, so say we had a patient with a bladder full of stones on x-ray and a urinalysis showed a high pH and high urea and the culture grew a proteus. How are we going to manage this one? Start on antibiotics for this one. Good. How long um, for? <clears throat> I have in my head about three to four weeks, but I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do. Um, what are you going to base your decision about when you stop antibiotics on? If your stones are gone. Yes. Why is that so important? Do they... Um act as a nidus or a source of the proteus. So if you've got stones there, you've still got proteus. Exactly, yeah. So these stones formed because of the infection. So the, the infection is right through those stones and the, the proteus is just sitting in there waiting to come out. So as the stone gets smaller, you're re constantly reinfecting the bladder. Um, so the recommendations are that we actually give antibiotics two weeks beyond radiographic resolutions of stones. So sometimes you end up with them on antibiotics for two months. If those stones are huge, they're going to take a while. What's the other component to dissolution? What else do we need to do other than antibiotics? Diet. Diet, exactly. What's the objective of the diet? You're reducing that pH and neutral, Good. like making it neutral. Good, exactly. Which will do what? Why? 
Sorry, All right, it, it dissolves the stones, but uh, uh, and, and makes it more likely to form calcium oxalate stones. But um, it it definitely I does. Can't get... Yeah, it's essentially the um, magnesium ammonium phosphate won't form in acidic urine. The pH just isn't favorable favorable for it. Um, so. Uh, the stones are shrinking and there's no more to add to it. So the antibiotics are sort of shrinking the stones and there's no more mineral um, kind of adding to them again. Um, excellent. What about if we did a radiograph and we're like, oh, no stones here. And then you did an ultrasound and said, oh, stones here. And it's a four-year-old male entire Staffordshire Bull Terrier. These exercises want to neuter it. These exercises. Yes, we should absolutely be neutered. Um, what stone are we thinking this would be? Cysteine. Cysteine, good, very good. So certain breeds you can be pretty presumptuous, and the combination of the radiolucency with the ultrasound evidence of stones uh, is quite um, like you can almost sort of say yes, this is cysteine. Um, so therapy for cysteine urolithes is going to mention as castration. Um, and what diet would we use? Is it UD? UD, yeah, exactly right. So it's the same as we would use for urate. Say we had a one-year-old pug who had intermittent neurological episodes and bladder stones. Um, but on biochem, the, everything looked pretty normal. How would you investigate that further? Would you go straight to surgery to do? No, what would you do? Bilateral stim. Good, excellent. Um, and I guess it, you've obviously looked at the bladder with the ultrasound. Make sure that somebody's looked at the liver as well. Although ultrasounds are not a very sensitive um, tool for getting shunts. Um, but certainly I'd be suspicious of urate, urolith in any young dog, even if they were asymptomatic and had normal liver enzymes um, of some form of shunting. Um, what do we what sort of clinical signs can we see with partially obstructed? urethral urolithiasis. You could see dysuria and some hematuria. Good. Um, so I have a patient who has one year of symptoms of straining to urinate, sometimes passing a completely normal stream, sometimes straining and not passing anything. Um, never has a completely full bladder, so it's definitely not obstructed. Um, but it's clearly having some sort of sort of spasm when it's trying to urinate because there's just nothing coming out. Um, and had had a really good workup, but had radiolucent stones in the urethra, none in the bladder, so no hints at all in the bladder. And the radiolucent stones were stuck just at the um, proximal the urethra just proximal to the os penis um, and the only way only reason we sort of ended up um, suspicious of it is palpating that urethra you could actually feel them and the dog squealed when we got close to it so obviously so painful but they've been there for a year so I'm sure that dog's going to stricture we flushed them back up into the bladder but I'm sure it's going to stricture uh, which hopefully won't be a problem as long as it can get its wee out and it doesn't form stones anymore. That was a four-year-old male entire staffy, so I'm pretty sure I know what they are. Um, now, that's probably all I wanted to cover today. Does anybody have any, any other questions that they wanted to go through? With the ure ureteral obstruction, like for hydronephrosis, uh, if the client, because it takes a bit of time to convince them for sub, sometimes financially, 
how mm. long can you persist with medical management that you know now it's like is there a guideline not really um it would depend a lot on um renal function so if i'm if i've got a non azotemic patient with a ureteral obstruction i'd probably say to the clients look we're probably going to forfeit this kidney we're probably going to lose it um and we're going to have to support the cat pain wise and things through it but she's still got a functional kidney and if we can then decrease the risk of the other kidney going then I, you can persist forever whereas if i had a patient with a potassium of nine and one kidney that had already died and the last remaining kidney obstructed uh, obstructed obstruction obstructed um then i would sort of say look you know where this is a lost cause and those are the ones that i decompress the the pelvis and I'm pretty aggressive about therapy. We didn't really talk about fluid rates or anything in terms of management of urethrolithiasis. And the reason I didn't is quite deliberate, but it's quite controversial. And all the authors are very opinionated about it. So you read a reference in a textbook or a paper and it says, this is what you should do, but there's completely opposing views. So some people say that you should like make them polyuric to try and flush it out and others say that that will exacerbate the back pressure and therefore the spasm and make them less likely to pass it and realistically we don't have enough evidence to know which it is or both of those theories make sense um so i would be titrating my fluid therapy to hydration status essentially i'm not i'm not going for polyuria i'm going for patient care basically um what else didn't we talk about with ureteral obstructions we didn't talk about indwelling um sometimes we put nephrostomy catheters in to if we can't go to surgery or we can't get a stent in or something like that um sometimes we'll put a little pigtail catheter in the renal pelvis and just keep that pelvis decompressed for a few days in the hope that they'll pass the stone that's a nice option because um, it takes away the back pressure. It gives you a chance to manage an infection because 80% of dogs with a ureteral stone will have an active pyelonephritis because the stasis causes ascending infection. Um, so it gives you a chance to clear the infection before you put a long-term indwelling device in there. Um, but that's something that just is so complicated to manage. You know, obviously, if the dog pulls it out and then you've got urine leaking, infected urine leaking in the retroperitoneal space, and it's just, they they can be really complicated. Um, anything else? Do people use shockwave therapy in Australia or lasers primarily for the dissolution of the um the lists um lasers for sure um lasers for sure the um the um sorry you know i can't i can't i can't i can't hear myself i'm just gonna mute your virus um uh so the lasers uh, we can't get up into the ureters and kidneys in most cases. Some big dogs we can, but most people don't have the equipment to get into the um, those areas in small dogs. So they're not they're not as good. But then our patients very rarely get stones big enough to be candidates for the um, extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So that's because the stones have to be over a centimetre in diameter. And it just never really happens in our patients. Like if they're a centimetre in diameter, they're never leaving the kidney because the ureter is too small for them to lodge in. So you, you can just kind of leave them there if they're not causing problems. Um, so it's not as useful. And I don't know of anyone doing it in Australia. In I, I know at AMC, they sort of said when I did my training there five years ago that they, they'd, done, they'd done it twice. They had the potential to do it, but they'd used the equipment twice. And they are the worldwide stone management capital um, clinic. So I would say it's probably not something any Australian clinics will invest in anytime soon. Hmm. All right, I'll wrap up. We'll give you two minutes overtime, Jeff. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna.
Uh, no worries. Good luck with your study, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.